Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Rachel Donovan. I'm a senior finance major, and I'm also a Leonard Leadership Scholar. Today, I have the privilege of introducing Mr. Julio Ramirez. Mr. Mr. Ramirez is the founder of JEM Global Consulting and former executive vice president of global operations for Burger King Corporation. Mr. Ramirez had an expansive career with Burger King spanning 26 years. He began his career at Burger King in an entry-level role and worked his way up to serve as president of the Latin America Mexico Caribbean Division. He is one of the most knowledgeable executives in the quick service restaurant industry today. In 2010, Mr. Ramirez left Burger King and founded Gem Consulting, a retail, restaurant, and franchising business. He also serves as an external board member of Grupo & Tour, the largest franchisee of American restaurant brands in Central America. We are so honored today to have him share his leadership experiences with us. So please turn off all your cell phones and join me in welcoming Mr. Julio Ramirez. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks. Rachel, thank you very much. Dean Knapp, uh, Marty, and uh, fellow, uh, fellow students from the University of Georgia. Certainly a lot younger than I am. Uh, great, great, uh, great crowd here today. Uh, somebody was telling me it was because of me. I also heard that there was a re required college credit for attending. So I'm, I'm going to bank that it may have been the second one. But thank you anyway, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll pretend it's for me. Uh, I'm very excited to be here today. Um, it's been many, many years since I've participated inside a class. I've been to a game or two. I've gotten an award thanks to Marty and company. But I really had a chance to be in a building, especially this building. This is really a historical building. It's just a wonderful venue. So I want to get right into what we're going to talk about today. And it's an it's a interesting topic, which everybody has an opinion about Burger King. But a lot of people don't know what's been behind Burger King for all the years. And uh, Burger King Corporation, um, has been owned, and this is kind of one of the highlights of today's presentation, was owned by five different groups in my 26 years there. And I can tell you, and if anybody here has ever worked for a company that had different owners, I can tell you that it can be a very different company depending who the leadership is. And I know that a lot of you here are here because of the leadership program. Uh, and, and leadership is what it's all about in terms of getting things done effectively in the world. And so uh, it was an adventure, to say the least. It was a wonderful career. I have nothing but positive things to say about the opportunities and challenges that I learned in business. And I think you should take that as a, as a, as a learning, which is it's, it's not only the good things that happen to you along the way, but even the tough ones that you learn from and make you a better executive over time. So let me get, let me get right into it, because the story today is really about a brand that survived in spite of all the changing leadership and culture. It survived because of the uniqueness of the brand uh, and at times the, the people that ran it. So I'm going to give you some, some real examples of how different things, different learnings from different executives without naming names that I learned during a different time. So let's, first of all, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a little bit about Burger King through the years, two seconds about my involvement there, and then talk a lot about how different it was in the different groups that own the, that own the brand. So uh, a few facts. First of all, Burger King was started in Miami, Florida, which is my home today, uh, and it was started in 1954, and to this day it is headquartered there. It was founded by an entrepreneur named Jim McLemore and David Edgerton. They were partners and got going, and they actually opened in Miami and Jacksonville, Florida at the same time. To this day, a lot of contests over who really opened first. Um, the early growth was in Florida and expanded quickly from there. As you can imagine, when you're only a two- or three-store business, you kind of grow and, and start growing that way. If anybody's been to Miami recently, uh, but even back then, you realize that Miami is the gateway to Latin America, so it's interesting that the culture of Burger King was shaped very much by Hispanics because of the, starting with my, my, my own culture, the Cuban population that emigrated, many Cubans went to Miami, Florida when the communists took over in Cuba. And so uh, part of the history of Burger King is really how it was one of the key corporations that really caused uh, America to start looking at Latin America to do business. And I think Burger King was one of the great companies where that started to happen. And, uh, and a lot of the success that Burger King had in Latin America was due to our strategic location being in South Florida. The first international market was Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is an interesting place. It's a commonwealth of the US. It's not a state, not an independent country. It's a commonwealth. Puerto Rico today, with 3.5 million people, has 180 Burger Kings. That, that's the most penetrated Burger King. That's unbelievable. You could be in one Burger King and see the next one. It's amazing. And the first one opened in 1963. 
and they're very high volumes. And by the way, as a side note, Puerto Rico has the highest Walmart in the U.S., the highest Sears, the highest J.C. Penney. People spend money. there. They must have the lowest savings of anyone in the Americas, but they certainly spend money in Puerto Rico. In 1967, and we're going to dive deep on each of these things, it was sold to, uh, BK was sold to Pillsbury uh, with a, about 400 Burger Kings at the time. So you can see the growth there from 54 to 67. Again, I'm going to talk, I'm going to do a deep dive on all of the owners. Uh, but during that time, after Pillsbury, Burger King began to expand outside of Latin America. And as you can imagine, having so many Spanish-speaking executives, even then, Spain was one of the first markets. And to this day, Spain is a place, if any of you have traveled there, where Burger King is actually larger than our other key competitor that I'll try to avoid saying. It's too many years fighting them. But you know who they are, right? The Golden Arches. So um, there are more Burger Kings. There's 400, I think, in Spain. So it was the first country. It was our entry into, into Europe. Um, and then in Australia as well, for example, there's another key market there. Interesting story about Australia, if anybody's been there, uh, they look, the restaurants look just like Burger King, but they have a different name. Inside the bun halves, it says Hungry Jack's. And that's because when we went, uh, when we, I'm not, no longer there, when, when Burger King opened in Australia, uh, someone actually had the name Burger King already, and at, at that time, someone didn't want to pay at Burger King, didn't want to pay $2,000 to take the attorney out. So we ended up calling it Hungry Jack because Pillsbury owned a brand of pancakes called Hungry Jack and the founder's name was Jack Cowan. So to this day, there's over 300 Hungry Jacks that look an awful lot like Burger King. So it's, it's an interesting relationship there. And I would say the last, uh, another significant piece about BK during the years was something known as the Battle of the Burgers. Now, I don't know how many of you here, maybe we could have a quick show of hands, are marketing majors. Quick show, of, there you go. Okay, so there's a lot of marketing folks. Believe it or not, BK, and there's been some more recent marketing activity, which I'll talk about later, but back then, some of the most successful advertising ever done, not only in the fast food business, was when Burger King did something known as the Battle of the Burgers. You guys were probably in Pampers at the time, but, but uh, at that time, Burger King actually went very aggressively. They always say, never talk about your competition. Always say positive things and focus on what you're all about. But at that time, we had a, a very good ad agency called J. Walter Thompson. Uh, in fact, if any of you have seen the show Mad Men, that reminds me a lot of, of, maybe that's a little bit extreme, it wasn't exactly like that, but it was very much a New York agency and, and life in the fast lane, if you will. But they did a very aggressive attack since McDonald's was a lot bigger. BK did a campaign called the Whopper Beat the Big Mac. They actually did taste tests and showed that people preferred a flame broiled Whopper versus the Big Mac. Did a lot of research and proof that that was true in many, and very much like the Pepsi versus Coke thing but actually was the first ad agency to do food photography, uh, great visual shots of produce flying around. I mean, stuff that was copied by many chains after that and did the world's first video coupon where if you would go into Burger King and say the Whopper beat the Big Mac, you would get a free Whopper if you bought one, et cetera. But very, very creative, very dynamic, and very successful for Burger King. They had something like three years of double-digit growth over the previous year. The... Uh, Moving along real quick, I, I took a little bit of time on the first chart just to see the depth of some of the stuff that you have. Now, in 1989, Pillsbury was sold to Grand Metropolitan, a name you will not recognize. It later became Diageo. You may know that name. It's the biggest liquor company in the world. So in 1989, th that was my introduction to the global world that we live in. It was a hostile takeover by a British company, Grand Met. Hundreds of Burger King executives were let go. I was fortunate to have survived that cut. And let me tell you, it was a close call. Three sets of layoffs, hundreds of people, offices were closed. Very, very difficult time. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the learnings from that. Um, however, after Grand Metropolitan began to know our business a little bit, uh, we had very broad international expansion. As you can imagine, they're a British company, so we expanded in Europe quite a bit, in Germany, uh, in many other countries in Europe, but also in Korea, et cetera. And, uh, and again, the, the Diageo connection came in 1997, uh, in fact, I was there in Scotland the day it was formed when Grand Metropolitan formed with Guinness Beer to form Diageo. And it was a, a huge conglomerate that included, they're the people that to this day produce Johnny Walker Scotch, uh, Smirnoff, which has one of the first vodkas, certainly a lot of competition in that since then, Bailey's, and they had to actually get rid of Bombay and other brands because they were too big in the U.S. So uh, Tanqueray Gin is theirs, et cetera. In 2002, because that was another big change, so imagine, imagine the changing leadership. You went from Pillsbury, a Bundt Cake dough company, 
to a spirits company, and Burger King was kind of underneath that. So you might be thinking, what does BK have to do with any of that? Well, it gets even better. In 2002, Burger King was sold to the sponsor group. That was our entry into the equity, equity world. It included Bain Capital of Mitt Romney fame. I'm sure you've heard that name. Texas Pacific Group, David Bonderman was the guy that started uh, the Continental uh, Airlines equity buyout, very successful growth there, and Goldman Sachs, you, I'm sure you've heard of them. Now, this is when Burger King began to take on some of the bigger markets in the world, like Brazil, which I was personally involved in, China, et cetera. I'll talk about that. The second biggest period for, the, for you marketeers, the second biggest period of marketing where I thought BK had some success with a small boutique agency in Miami called Crispin and Porter. Uh, they now have their creative operation in Colorado. Uh, they were named our ad agency, and for the first time, Burger King did not go with a big hotshot New York agency. We actually went with a creative boutique. Now, I'm going to talk about a lot of the stuff they did in, in a second, but the biggest thing that you probably know them from is what I call the creepy king. You may, you may or may not remember, but a few years ago, Burger, the old Burger King king, which we used to use when I started in the company, was used for grand openings, almost like a carnival atmosphere at a grand opening. There was a guy dressed up in a king costume. where well, they saw one of those in my office, and they ended up using the king in the TV advertising. Again, there were some positives with that, and there were also some areas of opportunity, which I'll share with you. But uh, interesting advertising. And then in 2006, Burger King went public for the first time in the New York Stock Exchange. I had a chance to actually see what those people were doing in there uh, in 2006, and we opened at $17 a share. In 2007, uh, well, let me move on to 2010. In 2010, Burger King was sold to a uh, Brazilian equity fund, a company uh, in New York, but the owners of which, the money of which, are 36 of the wealthiest families in Brazil. Uh, and that proved to be, that was my calling card. That was the, the last ownership group, and I was the first of many executives. In fact, the entire executive teams, all 13 of us, including the CEO, were let go in a period of six months and proceeded to let go about 500 executives out of an 800 executive business. So that was, that brought new def definition to the word painful. Um, you know, I, again, no regrets. They took good care of us. It was ugly. I didn't want to leave. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things I'd like to convey, both pros and cons about that. Um, and again, the company has again gone public uh, and is beginning to continue to expand in China and Brazil. So those are kind of the, th that's kind of the quick history of Burger King from a factual standpoint. But I want to talk about some of the learnings. Uh, but I, I want to tell you a little bit about my own background. First of all, very quickly, born in Cuba, left when I was seven years old, emigrated like many other Cuban people. Unlike other Cuban people, we ended up in good old Atlanta, Georgia, down the road, and that's where I grew up. I went to grammar school, high school, college, and MBA here at the University of Georgia. Um, so uh, a proud bulldog. We had very good football teams at the time. It was right before, everybody measures stuff here before Herschel and after. I was here before Herschel Walker. Um, but uh, a wonderful, wonderful place, and it's just so, so nice to be back here. Uh, initially worked for Xerox and AT&T, uh, and then I had a 26-year career at BK. Now, in my time at Burger King, again, there are people that have worked at Burger King. There are ladies that have worked at Burger King in the same store for 40 years. I mean, if you've ever been to a, wa I was at a Waffle House this morning having breakfast, I'm sure that, you know, Mabel that works there had been there for 30 years. So there's people who work very hard in the restaurant industry. It is not for the faint of heart. It's tough work. People get in very early in the morning and work till late at night. I, I was fortunate that of my 26 years, 16, I was a senior executive. What made that challenging was a senior executive with five different owners. That was very, very tough, and that's what I'm going to spend the most time on today. But uh, I had the opportunity to report directly to six different CEOs of many different industries. Again, no names will be used to protect the innocent. The important here is more to talk about what were some of the learnings from the different times that we had. And I was, in fact, the longest running senior executive in the history of Burger King. So I'm, a, it's, I'm proud to say that in a way, but I can tell you there are other companies out there that are proud to have many executives that have been executives for 20 years. So I hope, uh, I hope you get the chance to do the latter uh, because it was tough to do the, the former. Um, my time of my 26 years, I spent 12 running Burger King in Latin America and the Caribbean. Remember what I said at the beginning, because we were headquartered in Miami, uh, Latin America was kind of a, a, a successful target for us. We had proximity and speed to market. So uh, two things that I was very involved in that I think really uh, you know, helped get me to my last job, which was the global head of ops. One was a very successful opening of Burger King in Brazil. Brazil is a country, 
in, in case you don't know, it's one of the biggest countries in the world, not as big as Russia, which is in the news lately, but it's 75% of the U.S. The city of Sao Paulo, which is where we opened, uh, the city has, in the metropolitan area, 22 million people. Uh, the state that it's in is 36 million. They have five cities with over 4 million people. It's a big place. 48% of that Sao Paulo is middle class, so it's a, it's a fairly affluent city for a Latin American market, not, not necessarily like Europe. Uh, Mexico, for example, where Burger King today has 400 restaurants, 18% of Mexico City is middle class. So you know the type of sophisticated place it was. It was a country with a lot of inflation. It was a difficult place. KFC tried to go there three times and failed because of local competitors. Arby's failed there. McDonald's did not. McDonald's, and I give them credit. I said I wouldn't say their name, but you have to give them credit. They are probably the most recognized company in the world, along with maybe Coca-Cola. And they are everywhere you want to be. I mean, they are, in a, in a way, my job was easy because I knew that wherever McDonald's built, they had done the market studies to be able to, we knew we could go near them and compete very effectively against them. And that was, in fact, our strategy in opening Brazil. We didn't attack them directly like the Battle of the Burgers. We actually used them as a point of reference. We said Burger King, now, now neighbor in Ibirapuera Mall in Sao Paulo. We actually used them as our friendly neighbor. And that actually worked to propel us as a very successful competitor. Uh, and so we opened the first, we were late getting there. We got there starting in 2004. But within today, it's not that far away. It's 10 years. There's close to 300 restaurants in Brazil. Uh, the most successful division of Burger King was the Latin America division for many reasons. I'll, I'll save that for the end, talking about leadership a little bit. But we were larger than McDonald's in numbers of stores in 16 of the 25 countries. We're very proud of that. We, we very much thought we were like guerrilla warfare against a big corporate uh, group. Uh, in Mexico, McDonald's started in 1985. We started in 1991. Today, there are more Burger Kings than McDonald's in Mexico. And again, a very successful growth over time. There's over 400 stores there. And I think, um, talking a little bit about leadership, I think that the type of leadership that we tried to put in, and, and I very much believe in team. You know, there is no I in team, as I like to say. We really believe in strong succession planning. We really believe every position in our company. Uh, and again, it helps when you're in a growth mode. So if you're anywhere working for a company with growth, make sure that growth isn't like the Wild West. Make sure it's very organized and that you let everybody in that company know the importance that they have in adding to that growth. So everybody in our team knew if we work hard and we open the stores we say we're going to open, then next year you're an assistant manager today. You'll be a restaurant manager next year. And guess what? Two years later, you'll be a district manager. There's a place for you in the organization. Work hard, and we'll get you there. And that's exactly what we did in, in Mexico specifically. So very clear goals and objectives for everybody in the organization. We even did succession planning for our restaurant managers, not just above restaurants, for the restaurant managers. We actually talked about, okay, if, if, if tomorrow you got promoted, who would take your place? You need to have somebody ready that can take your place. Big, big believers in that. So let everybody know how they fit into the organization. And the other thing I would say is surround yourself with the very best people. Don't be intimidated by people that may be smarter than you. I am living proof of that. I can tell you that. You want to surround yourself with, you know, if, if my background, for example, was more marketing than ops. So I always make sure that I had a strong financial person, a strong real estate person, and a great operator, somebody that worked in the restaurant since they were, you know, yay big as an assistant manager. And so always try to build your organization. Think about who you want to surround yourself with because it will make your job tremendously easier and it will make everybody feel better because you have the right people doing the right things. Let me talk a little bit about uh, Burger King. The brand. Burger King does not have a lot of differences from others, but it has two very critical pieces, one of which I think along the way has been lost, but the other one remains. You probably know what it is because over the years, Burger King changed ad agencies a lot and we changed taglines a lot. I'm sure you can name a few. You know, have it your way always comes to mind. I mean, sometimes you got to break the rules. I mean, a lot of different things. But I will tell you that flame broiling is the preferred way that people like to cook burgers. It's as simple as when you cook a burger in the backyard, you're cooking on an open flame and you're cooking over fire, right? So we know all over the world, that's not just a U.S. phenomenon, that flame broiling and fire grilling, as they call it in Europe, is the preferred way of cooking burgers. Not because of the procedure, but because it tastes better. That, it's the perceived taste. There's also, believe it or not, a slight health connotation. Because when you broil stuff, you see, you know, the juice drops off. And so though, those... That simple differentiation in any business you do, whether you're talking about hamburgers or whether you're talking about computer software, whatever it is, the more you can differentiate, it, it can be one thing. And if it is one thing and it's clear, then push that point and make that the one thing that you do. 
So that was the, that, and, 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 and I would say for us, that flame broiling equals great taste was a big powerful thing. The second one is have it your way. Now today, uh, McDonald's, for, if you want a Big Mac without sauce, they can do it. Back then, and many years ago, McDonald's used to batch cook 12 burgers at a time. And so it wasn't easy for them to give you a Big Mac without sauce. So we had, there was a competitive advantage, not we. We, Burger King had a competitive advantage to be able to provide a product exactly the way you wanted it. You know who I think does a great job of that today would be Starbucks. You know, I don't know how many of you are Starbucks users. There's millions. As you know, there's a Starbucks across the street from each other. They're today's McDonald's, in my opinion. And, uh, and there's good and bad about that. But anyway, Starbucks, when you order the coffee, they'll either put your name on it or they'll, they'll know you by your name. They ask your name. That's a very personalized way, but it makes you feel like you're getting your cup of coffee. It's got your name on it. It's exactly the way you want it. That's a very powerful emotional hook, and it's an emotional hook that Burger King owned for many, many years. Uh, it goes back, some of us here, I won't name who, will remember the campaign, Have It Your Way, Hold the Pickles, Hold the Lettuce. I mean, there was a whole song about that, but it was a very custom customized approach to getting BK. So, now I think over the years that has been lost, and it hasn't been lost because Burger King took its eyes off the ball. It's been lost because just about anybody today is, begin, is doing that cook-to-order type thing. There's a lot of new hamburger chains they call it the bigger burger category. Uh, everything from Shake Shack to you know, uh, Burger 21, there's a lot of concepts opening up with great toppings and, and very, very customized, excellent burgers. So, however, BK, because of all the years, still has that flame broiling thing, and that's probably the thing that they will keep. So there you go, there's some, a burger being cooked on an open fire there. So, now let me, let me focus on what were some of the learnings for each of the ownership group, and again, the purpose here, by the way, is not to uh, make any C. I, I don't name any of the CEOs. In fact, I don't know that I remember all the CEOs. We had a lot. But the purpose is more just what were some of the learnings during the different types of styles that we had. So, so for example, I mentioned that Pillsbury, I call it the Pillsbury era from 67 to 88. Uh, Jim, Jim McLemore, the founder, realized that they needed to sell to a bigger company. He wasn't growing fast enough, so they, he sold the brand to Pillsbury. Now, this brought a lot of discipline, as you can imagine, discipline and resource to the brand. If any of you have worked or done internships with Procter & Gamble or Coca-Cola or Colgate, you'll know that packaged goods companies are very, very process-oriented in their, in their product development, et cetera. Well, Pillsbury was a little bit like that. And so uh, they took over a company that literally, Burger King was like the Wild Wild West. And so it was, a very, it was an interesting cultural fit when you think about people that make, you know, prepared dough products that take many years to innovate at the time, they're moving a lot faster today. With Burger King, they was doing a different promotion every month, so it was a real cultural clash. Um, but I'll give you an interesting tidbit. I don't know if anybody here has heard of Brinker International. They're based in Dallas. Well, Norman Brinker, who has passed away, he was one of the icons in the restaurant industry. He actually was a CEO of Burger King, and there was a time where Pillsbury had a division that had restaurants, and they included, you, you may know some of these, some have gone away, Steak and Ale, Bennigan's, uh, Hagen das ice cream still around today, different company. Quick Walk, which was the first fast food Asian business, which went away. I think today there's, there's another one out there. I forget the name. Somebody here can think of it, but it's uh, Panda Express, right? So Quick Walk was a version of that that didn't make it. But anyway, Norm Brinker ran that division, but he specifically ran Burger King for a while. Norm Brinker was one of the, the founders of casual dining. He was the one that developed Chili's. I'm sure you're very, very familiar with them. So, um, so what were some of the biggest insights of the Pillsbury era? First of all, um, the difference in styles, I think there's learnings for both. Uh, packaged goods probably need to move quicker and less analysis paralysis. Fast food probably needs to be a little more process oriented. So it was a very, very interesting mix and there's no right or wrong answer. It's more about how you work together in that environment. And secondly, the importance of strategic alliances. Burger King was late getting into the breakfast game. Guess what Pillsbury made? Biscuits and other prepared dough. So they actually helped us formulate our, our biscuit program. We had scratch biscuits. You know, uh, I was talking to Dean Knapp. Dean Knapp was friends with one of our first uh, franchisees, Marvin Schuster in, in, in Columbus, Georgia. And they made, they made biscuits from scratch. Every store had a biscuit lady that was there at five in the morning making biscuits. And it was just getting too labor intensive. So Pillsbury helped us develop a, a biscuit that was already, you know, prepared. You just had to heat it up, but it had good quality. So very interesting. And, and it was my first experience with a strategic alliance between companies that specialized in a certain area. Now, the, on the Grand Metropolitan, again, I'll, uh, for the sake of time, I think I'll, I'll focus on the, on the bigger stuff, but 
It was the beginning of global, this is 1989, this is not 2014. In 1989, the global competition had already started. British companies were buying hotel chains in the U.S., restaurant chains in the U.S. This was, very, this was my first experience with layoffs. Uh, lots of people were let go, they all had code names, people brought in on Saturdays, people filed out, a very intimidating type thing. I was blessed to, by the, by the grace of God, survive some of that. But great learning, when you go from having a lot of people to a few, guess what happens? You begin to get very industrious because you still have to compete in the marketplace. So we learned the ability to work with a lot less resource. That was something that was important for our company at the time. It took a few years to get it there, but I will tell you that in 1993 and 94, we had a campaign known as the Back to Basics campaign. We had gotten too many products on the menu. You know, we were known for the Whopper, but we had added chicken, you know, we were grilling all kinds of different products, different burgers, too many cheeses, too many toppings. We got way off the reservation with too many things. So we had kind of a back to basics campaign where we almost looked like what, what a Five Guys today looks like or Johnny Rockets in terms of the menu. And we found that that actually worked for us. We had a music, a music campaign. It was just simple. Focus on the Whopper, great price value. We reduced our prices, not super cheap, but price, everyday low prices. And it actually worked for us for many years. We also had something that was another strategic alliance that was very positive, and you guys may be a product of this as children, was our five-year relationship with Disney. Now, I don't know if any of you here were kids when Beauty and the Beast came out uh, with the movie and, and the video and everything else, but Burger King had, in spite of the fact that McDonald's had a many, a many years after that had the relationship locked up, we actually had the benefit of having, in my opinion, the best Disney movies ever. I mean, I have three girls that are all grown women, but they were all little kids around that time. And I remember sitting around watching, I could probably recite every song in Beauty and the Beast, but Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, Toy Story 1, that was before now, they're all animated like that, but The Lion King was, The Lion King was the, that was the stairway to heaven of our, I mean, that was great merchandising, we rolled out products, there was no lion meat or anything like that, but we, great, great creative, we had all the collection of toys of all the characters, we did Pocahontas, I mean, the list just went on. For those of you Marketing freaks, Saatchi and Saatchi were our advertising agency at the time for kids, and N.W. Ayer uh, was one of our agencies, and so was Darcy out of St. Louis. So again, we went through a lot of agencies at the time. During this time of Grand Met, again, regional offices went away. Uh, I got my first laptop computer. I got my first cell phone. I remember, I remember a VP telling me, hey, you're, you're not, your level's not high enough to have a cell phone yet. So I mean, it was a big deal. I remember the first cell phones looked like, like if you were G.I. Joe, these huge phones, right? So we went through all of the technology stuff, which now is moving much faster, as all of you know. Uh, so my insights there were you can always bring back resources if you cut too deep. That's positive. Um, taught, taught us to adapt to drastic changes. The word, if you've heard, it, those of you that had any liberal arts classes, the Renaissance man, we actually, at one time, they eliminated the marketing department. So our operations people had to do the marketing, the finance, the real estate. So we had these Renaissance people, 50 people for the whole U.S. from before we had 300. So you talk about learning how to do different things quickly. It was interesting. Um, and then also learn to put the resources close to the consumer. So we focused on the resources that the franchisees could see. A lot less corporate staff. So that was good learning for all of us. Um, then came the Diageo era, the, the formation. That was really Grand Met getting more sophisticated. We, we got a little more sophisticated. We went from having a, a U.S. brand that had a bunch of Burger Kings in different countries to a regional a global brand that had presidents of Asia, president of Europe, president of Latin America. So we began to understand the world, not that everything in the U.S. has to go out, that there are great successful centers of excellence. We had one in Munich, in Madrid, in Mexico City. So we were able to import ideas and we began to figure out that not all great ideas start in the U.S. Many start in the U.S., but not all. And I think that was a useful learning for us. And I think that's, a, that's an important point. Um, we all went through this marketing formal training of the Diageo way of brand building, which was more packaged goods, but it helped our marketing people get a little more effective in, in the, po the products we developed. It was also a time, a very challenging time in North America. If you know anything about the 90s, you know that that was when Taco Bell was starting to do the famous 39 cent tacos. It was very aggressive on price point. Checkers, if you know that chain, rallies, a lot of these 99 cent burgers, a lot of competition. And it caused the big boys to, we had to get very aggressive in price, but it was, it was a real market share battle. We had lots of issues with the franchisees in the U.S. International, I think, was, was doing okay, but the U.S., lots of issues. And, and this is important. If any of you ever work in a franchise business, this is a side note, but just a little bit of comment, I would say. 
I lasted a long time at Burger King, and I, I give a lot of credit to the franchise owners because they're the people that know the business. They're the ones that have their investment in that restaurant. It may say McDonald's or Wendy's or whatever, but that investment was paid for by a franchisee who maybe took out a loan or borrowed money from his Uncle Fred or got a partner. And, and those are the, at the end of the day, those are the people that have built all the restaurant industry in the U.S. It's the franchise owners, by the way, with a lot of labor, some from the U.S., some from not. The people that run the restaurants are not always from the U.S., so that franchise business is very important. Any franchisor that doesn't respect the effort of a franchisee, that's not a good place to be. And any franchisee that, that doesn't respect the franchisor, the same thing. I think it has to work for both. At that time at Burger King, I can tell you that there are a few times at BK where I felt like some of our executives, maybe they were in the ivory tower, but they forgot where they came from. They forgot that the business is made at the cash register and the people you know, bagging the fries and making the burgers. And I would say don't ever forget that. No matter what job you have, Think about the people doing the work, and don't ever forget that. Uh, and if you get the chance to do their work for a little bit, I and mean, we had mandatory days when we worked in the stores. Chick-fil-A, I think, is a brand that I would tell you does a good job of that today uh, and has always done that. So that was the beginning for me, knowing that, uh, you know, know where your bread is. But the other thing I would say is don't take your eyes off the ball. If you're in a company that's doing international growth, don't forget about the U.S. If that's the biggest part of your business, Know where your bread is buttered. Know where the biggest part of your revenue and profits come from. And don't get so fixated or charmed by, oh, let's go to Italy, let's go to Brazil. Make sure you're making money where you need to be making money. And then if time permitting, uh, and if there's opportunities, you do it. But you always take sure you take care of the biggest part of the business. And that's what happened to BK at the time. And it was such, a, and it was such an ugly moment that a different group ended up uh, buying the business because Diageo was not able to make Burger King work. And it spun off Burger King. It also spun off Pillsbury that became, it tied into General Mills. Um, so that's, in my opinion, while those years were difficult, I would tell you that the time of Bain Capital, and there were three groups that came together to buy Burger King, I would tell you that was one of the greatest learnings for me. Uh, in the sense that the easy thing in life, this is another little truism, the easy thing in life is to come in as a new guy and fire people. It sounds like, oh, what a horrible thing. Well, you know, Sometimes people like to come in and fire people just for the heck of it, just to make a statement. And I would tell you, be careful. Take a little bit of time. Understand what's going on. Because there have been people, and I'm, I'm not saying this for me, there were a lot of people at Burger King that worked many years than I did, more years than I did, who were let go as well. A lot of talent was let go by Burger King for people that were too quick to make a quick buck by reducing salaries. And, and the relationship with franchisees and the institutional learning is very important. So... I give credit to Bain. Bain did not come in and fire a bunch of people. They might have taken a few people out that needed to go over time. The difficult thing in life is to add resource for organic growth. It's knowing where are the big, not just the low-hanging fruit. Firing people is, the, is part of the low-hanging fruit. How do you know what are the projects you need to do? For example, we were not in Brazil in 2002. So Diageo turned my plan to go into Brazil down in 2000. And in 2001, I kept pitching it every year because we had too many issues in the U.S. and the U.K., I was told. Good plan, Julio, but we need to focus on that. Okay. Bain Capital realized Brazil is a place that has 800 McDonald's. Hello? We need to be there, and we need to do it right. So they gave me enough money, even though it was a franchise business, they gave me enough money to be able to launch Brazil, open a small office of literally four men and a dog, three women, four men and a dog, and we were able to open in Brazil, and with those seven people, we were able to sign the first ten franchisees in different parts of Brazil. They're all there today except the main guy who sold for a lot of money. He's my friend for life. Um, so the, the point being is they had the insight to be able to spend some money to make some money. It would be really easy to say, let the franchisees just open that. They can pay for everything. No, we had to, we had to provide some local, on the ground, Portuguese-speaking, Brazilian, you know, Brazilian people. It was nine hours from Miami. I could not use my Spanish-speaking team there. So that was an example of one of the many things that, that Bain did in, in each area of the business. They helped us to redo some of our uh, cooking capability to cook thicker burgers so we could cook Angus burgers if you remember that campaign uh, we could cook frankly an entire chicken we, we never did it but we had the ability to cook bigger products that was an investment by Bain into the kitchens that we remod remodeled all of our stores so anyway the, bon the bottom line is I've already talked a little bit about, about the, the Creepy King trust me the Creepy King did, he went off the reservation a little bit with some of the commercials we did my favorite being my favorite one not to do being Wake Up With The King. That was a strange commercial. But, they, but, but the, king, the king was also the one we used in some of the NFL. We were tied into the NFL, so we had the king dressed as one of the wide receivers in some of the commercials. And, uh, and it brought, I always say that great advertising needs to do three things. It needs to be memorable, hopefully in a good way. It needs to be frequent, 
But more importantly, it needs to have brand differentiation. You need to know what, what are you selling. I, I don't know how many times you've seen the lady from Progressive Insurance or Aflac. You know, and you may wonder, what does a duck have to do with anything? Well, you know what? You probably remember some of the Aflac commercials. Now, some of those are better at explaining why things are different there. In my opinion, it should be memorable, but it also, think about, does it help you remember what, what it is they're pushing? What is it about it? And if it doesn't, maybe the advertising is not necessarily that great. So think about those things. Now let me go to um, continued. Uh, and this is when finally, with that same group in Bain, we finally went public for the first time. Uh, we had a chance to go to New York, do the whole New York Stock Exchange thing. Uh, and what, it taught, what going public for me taught me a couple things. Birking had always been, we had been part of a larger stock, like Grand Met was traded in, in England. But we'd never been our own brand standing on our own. This was the first time we had clear line of sight. So it taught us, Burger King executives at the time, the importance of being measured and accurate in our communications. When you're a public product, when you're a public, publicly traded product, uh, people are buying your stock. You need to be very transparent and very open about what's going on. If you don't, you can go to jail. But besides that, you can also get in a lot of trouble. So I certainly didn't want to be in an orange jumpsuit any time in my life in, in a prison. So I always did my part to be very measured in my response, be very conservative in your forecasts. You know, if you think you're going to open 10 stores, say you're going to open five. All, and that, you're not just doing it for sandbagging, it's just that stuff happens. And so you need to be careful you don't oversell and overpromise. Now, we opened very, you know, our stock actually got as high as 31. We opened at 17. Unfortunately, as you well know, and this you did live through, the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression hit this country in 2008. This country and others. Uh, others recovered even faster than us. But um, I will say this, Burger King at the time, other than McDonald's, who, and if, if you go back and remember what McDonald's was doing at the time, McDonald's remodeled, instead of building new stores, they remodeled all of their restaurants. They put in their Mac Cafe, which I, I remember questioning, what does that have to do with anything? But, you know, they were right on. That gave them the ability to compete against Starbucks, against Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, they were already everywhere you wanted to be, so it gave them another something else they could sell the consumer. They went to value pricing, which a lot of other chains did as well, but they were very consistent in their value pricing. And they had a great breakfast lineup as well. McDonald's did not feel the impact of the crisis like everybody else did. Uh, Burger King got hit pretty hard, and yet we still maintain positive customer counts. You know, sales is a function of two things. Check average, what you're, what you're ringing up in the register, your ticket, and the customer counts, how many people are coming in. We at least had more customers coming in than before. So, Maybe we weren't selling as much, but it, the worst thing to have is less customers coming in. So we, we did okay. It could have been worse. We didn't crash and burn, uh, but unfortunately, we were not able to compete with McDonald's. McDonald's market share was going up. And, and by the way, Burger King outperformed many others that were struggling during that time. I think the, the issue of franchisees and franchisor being aligned, again, the issues happened because of pricing. The corporation wanted to be more aggressive on price in the U.S. The franchisees less aggressive on price. And by the way, not everything, I don't want to paint it that the corporation's always wrong. There are certain franchise owners that have been around for a long time. They own the real estate. They didn't want to invest in the brand. They were just happy making their money and didn't want to really take to the next level. So that's the challenge you have as a franchisor is how do you find new franchisees? How do you motivate your franchisees to do the right thing? But these issues created some challenges for us. And to make a long, the, the biggest insight for me was you need to be aligned throughout the organization, not only with your own team, but also with your franchise owners. It needs to be one team. Customers don't know whether that's a company-owned Chick-fil-A or a franchise Chick-fil-A. They just know it's Chick-fil-A. It needs to be seamless, and it needs to be run the right way. The other learning for me is a house divided cannot stand. You've got to have alignment with your franchisees. You have to have alignment with your own team. I think there's a saying, the emperor has no clothes. I'm not sure I really understood the, the, the whole message there, other than don't be afraid to tell your boss. I, I give, give credit to my last CEO. He said, Julio, don't just when you give me your weekly report, don't just tell me the good news. Tell me what's not going as well. And I would always tell, always go to your people down below and tell them, please, feel free to tell me, what am I doing wrong? What's not going well? You, do, you lose nothing by being open with your boss. And if you have a boss that accepts that, God bless America. That's a good thing. You, you, you want to have that level of transparency with your boss. So, and then lastly, manage expectations and, and make sure you have measured communications um, in the things that you do. So 3G. Uh, I've talked a little bit about it. I know less about them because I was only there three weeks with them. But uh, 3G is a company, in case you didn't know, they are the owners, these Brazilian families. I don't want to, I'm, I'm making it sound like it's the godfather. I mean, these are just people that have investments in the U.S. Very wealthy people. There's three that are extremely wealthy, like 
like your Warren Buffetts, Gates, Carlos Slim, the guy in Mexico, whatever, very wealthy, a lot of money in New York. These people bought a brewery or a company. They formed a company called Ambev. It's an Austrian company, but all the owners are Brazilian. And guess who they own? Anybody want to take a guess what beer brand in the U.S. they own? The king of beers? Anheuser-Busch. They've been owned by them for years. They have bought just about every other big. They bought Grupo Modelo, the biggest beer in Mexico. Uh, certainly all the brands in Brazil. So these folks bought Burger King at $24 a share. It was a 43% premium. We sold the company very well. Thank you very much. We didn't have a choice. Goldman Sachs wanted out. We had to sell it. Julio goes sayonara, peacefully off, non-compete. I couldn't work for a competitor for a while. Now, tremendous. If I thought Grand Met cut people, these folks cut. They, they took the remaining, you know, if there were 700 people, because, you know, over time, companies grow. That's the other thing is, one quick learning. It's real easy to add people to solve problems. I would always say, before you add people, Sit down with everybody there and say, okay, guys, we want to be lean and mean. Who here can absorb the extra work? Because if pain comes, guess what has to happen? People need to get let go. I'd rather we take the pain and all have our tongues hanging out from working hard than not having a job. And I think it's real easy to throw people at the answer every time. And all of a sudden, GNA, what they call it, GNA creep. GNA begins to creep in the organization. That's how companies get bloated. Well, these people cut to the bone. There's, there's letting people go, and then there's letting everybody go. These people let everybody go to the bone. I mean, to the point where we'll bring back whatever we screwed up. Well, they screwed up a lot. I, I don't want to sound like sour grapes. I mean, there's a lot of people at Burking that I know, great people at all levels that are we're out. They're not on the street. They're, frankly, good news is they're working somewhere else because BK people have run lean over the years. This was not Anheuser-Busch that had not been bought and sold five times. They just recently bought Heinz Ketchup. So, you know, I could have called the CEO at Heinz and said, hey, if they said they're going to make a couple tweaks, get out of town. So, you know, 5,000 people in, in, you know, the city of Pittsburgh is a new city after, after these guys have bought them. Same thing happened in St. Louis with Anheuser-Busch, same thing in Miami. I have a vision of a bunch of Brazilians hanging American corporations in their, in their family room, drinking a sip and a tea or whatever. But, so, so be careful. All I'm saying is, you know, if, if, better you get lean than somebody make you get lean. And I think that's part of the lesson today is think about, you know, read a great book, homework assignment. There's a book called Dethroning the King. They're not talking about Burger King. That, that king's still there. They're talking about Anheuser-Busch. It's a great book because it, tell, it tells you how Augie Bush and the Bush family built Anheuser-Busch. The first half of the book is all about that. The second half is how they were asleep at the wheel when these guys were buying up other companies and eventually took them out. Um, so anyway, mistakes they made, they initially copied McDonald's strategy. The Burger King budgets, the stores do half of what a McDonald's does. A McDonald's does $2 million plus a year. Uh, Burger King does about a million something. The first thing the Brazilians did, again, since they fired everybody, the good news for the franchisees is, guess what? They fired everybody. There was nobody to say no. So people could roll out. <laughs> we can roll out whatever you want. There's nobody to say no. There was no process. They took so many people out. So all of a sudden, everything franchisees wanted to do was happening. Before you know it, our menu looked like McDonald's copycat, smoothies, coffee, the whole bit. And guess what? Burger King does not have enough media to, to promote all those things. And what did I say earlier? What is Burger King known for? Great tasting, differentiated, flame broiled burgers. Well, they're back on it. Took them a year. They wasted a year, but now they're back on the burger theme. So um, those things happen sometimes when takeovers happen. And some of the institutional knowledge goes out. So biggest insights, it's not just about cutting costs. That's easy. You've heard that before. Organic growth, in investing in the right things, listen to your franchisees, and relationships are important. I'm not saying your whole team ought to have, you know, 59-year-old guys like me, but it's nice to have a balance in your organization uh, when you do stuff. So my final thoughts, and, and uh, then I'd be glad to open up for any questions. This is a, definitely a global marketplace, and I think the headline is, it's with or without us. It's with or without us. I had the opportunity prior to the most recent activity to be in Moscow on vacation, not on business, and we were involved, some of the strategies we used in, in Brazil to open with shopping mall locations, et cetera, to open quickly. Sorry about that. Um, so we open in Russia, and let me tell you, people that are your age in Russia, they're, they're about going to school and getting, getting their job, and they're, they're all about, they're not into the politics. A lot of the stuff on TV is all politics. There's real people out there trying to make a living, and some are smart, and some folks are going to, and some folks are, in fact, buying companies in the U.S., and, and companies are, are expanding, et cetera. Again, with you, without you. Two books I'd recommend you read, Dethroning the King by Julie McIntosh. The other one, it's an old book, it's called The Clash of Civilizations. Uh, it's not a, it sounds like a historical book. It's not meant to be something about the Middle Ages. 
It's, it's, it's a book that divides the world not by geographical, po political boundaries, more by culture. What, and, and I think there's seven, seven groups. It's a great, fascinating book. But it tells you what happens in the world. It has nothing to do necessarily with, with business per se. It's more about interacting and dealing with other parts of the world. Uh, fascinating book. It taught me a lot as I travel a little bit out there. Another point, learn a second or a third language. Don't worry about how foolish you might sound speaking a language, but learn a second or third language because you know what? Most of the world does. Most of the world does. Doesn't mean you've got to go and learn Mandarin tomorrow, but 16% but, uh, of the U.S. is Hispanic. Again, I'm not pushing, a, a, you know, I, I love Hispanics. I am one, but that's not what I'm pushing here. What I'm pushing is learn a different language because you may find it's an asset when you sit around your executive team or your middle management team and you find out that everybody else speaks a second language. At BK at one time, 70% of our executive group based in Miami was not from the US. We had people from Scotland, India, et cetera. You know? So uh, we live in a world where Burger King is run by Brazilians, Anheuser-Busch. Jaguar is owned by an Indian company. I remember one of our CEOs was the CEO of Jaguar. He's a you know, very proper British guy and will remain nameless. He's no longer there. That's an Indian company now. Again, they may still be a very proper Indian guy. I'm just saying it's a different culture that owns it. Zara, you probably heard of that store. Uh, quick speed to market. Talk about speed to market. There's a Zara in every big city in, in the U.S. and throughout the world selling high fashion clothes at a low price. Fourth wealthiest guy in the world. Guy came from nothing. Family owned. Guy from Spain. BMW, Munich, Germany today. The economy of Germany today is driven by the automobile industry down south. I can tell you that... Uh, BMW has manufacturing plants in the U.S. and a lot of other companies are starting to make. Heineken. When you think of Heineken, what do you think of? You know, Dutch beer, green bottles, whatever. That ain't just made in Holland. Heineken makes their bottles all over the world. They're, they're, our, they're a global player. China is spent, while we're, while we're thinking whether we should be doing this or that, China is visiting countries in Africa and Latin America offering to build bridges, highways, infrastructure in countries that need it because they know that long term that's going to put them in the best position to be the, the, the business of choice and opening other industries there. So um, I guess I want to leave you, I don't want to leave you on a negative note, I want to leave you on a positive note. So guess what? My favorite story, Chick-fil-A. When I was a Cuban refugee, not in the U.S. very long, I used to go to the Atlanta Braves game when they played, not in this stadium, but in the old Fulton County Stadium when it first opened. I never heard of Chick-fil-A until I went to my first Braves game and the first Chick-fil-A I ever bought was inside the, you know, in the, they were just selling hamburgers inside the, inside the stadium. That's still the same product today in the aluminum wrap, little butter, and a pickle. Look at that business that's become now with freestanding restaurants. They, they, do, they do the same level as a McDonald's, and they're closed on Sunday. They have no stores outside the U.S. What an opportunity. Panera Bread, great brand, over $2 million a year, not one store outside the U.S. Maybe, maybe they have something in Asia or Europe recently. And Chipotle Grill, again, it's, it's, a, it's not really a Mexican brand, but it's kind of a Tex-Mex brand developed here in the U.S. Not much, if anything, outside the U.S. My only point is, guys, certainly it's good that you look, look at Atlanta and look at, there's a great opportunity to take certain brands to the west of the U.S. There's a lot of stuff to, to do and there's a lot of work to be done and we need great people to do it. So um, get geared up. It's a lot of fun and that, that's just the food industry. There's a million other industries, as you know. So that's my, that's my story, and I'll be glad to take any questions. You know, I don't know how you want to do that. But. Okay, we're going to open up the floor to a couple questions, so go ahead. Oh, that was, this must be the plan, a plan question. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for coming today. My name is Margaret Patton, and I'm with the Institute for Leadership Advancement. And I'm a senior accounting major here at Georgia. Okay. Um, the Institute of Leadership Advancement is a values-based organization. I was wondering, during your time as an executive, what you believe your values have been that have guided you. Thank you. That's a great, great question. I talked a little bit about it, but I think this, is, this hits to the heart. And this is, now, uh, my, the answer now is Julio Ramirez. This is not Burger King Corporation. This is my style. Um, and there's really two answers to that. Number one, I, I'm a big believer in a lot of communication. With, not only with your, you, you heard me talk about your boss. It's important they know that you know where he stands, but also that he knows where you stand. But I'm a big, if you think of a cross, you know, that you want to communicate up and down the organization, you also want to communicate with your peers. In other words, there may be departments, 
uh, you know, I was in, for many years I was running a Latin America region, but you know, we were, we were neighbors with our U.S. business. So we, I made it a point to make sure that our marketing people were communicating with the marketing people in the U.S. so that, so that great ideas were interchanged. So I'm a big believer. I, I probably, if I've sinned, and we all have sins, nobody's perfect in the business world. I've probably sinned on the side of over-communication versus not communicating. I think the worst sin is when you don't tell people what you're doing and you work in a silo when you don't share what you're doing. So, so one, big, one big value for me is a very open communication uh, and very direct communication. And I, I don't love conflict. I, I do it. And you have to in business sometimes. You've got to call it as it is and be very direct. I think my wife taught me that over the years. I have a very good marriage thanks to her. She taught me a lot to be very direct with your, with your feelings and, and open and don't, don't hide things. Don't be in a meeting and then walk out and start complaining or bitching, excuse my French, about what didn't go well in the meeting. I think it's important you put, think, put the cards on the table. So that, that's one big one. Secondly was the point that I talked about. This is more about my Latin America team. The Burger King Latin America story is an interesting story. A lot of issues were happening in North America with the franchisees. But somehow, maybe because we were a smaller team, but they allowed us to really focus and work as a team. We did not have the turnover that existed in North America. And so, and I'm not saying for some me, I'm talking about my whole team. I had an experienced team. Uh, I, let, I, I let people, people that, are, people that have good values, uh, people that have values where you feel like you can trust them, I let them, I gave them a long runway. I didn't, I didn't like micromanaging. I am definitely a person that believes in letting people, I'd rather have somebody that does eight out of ten things right than two perfect things and ask for permission 50 times. It's better to move quick. Uh, but Burger King, we were only 6% of the company, and yet we were 10% of the profit. So we were very small, successful, the little engine that could type thing. And we began to, you know, when we opened Brazil, it was a huge thing for our brand. Um, so communication, uh, focus on results, frequent, not meetings for the sake of meetings, but very frequent dialogue over are we meeting, are we meeting, what are the few things we need to be doing, focus on a few things, and make sure that everybody understands what their role is. So that there's no doubt. So whether you're the VP of real estate or you're the, assistant marketing guy or you're the guy in Costa Rica doing operations, make sure everybody knows how they fit into the puzzle and have clear alignment on what's supposed to happen. And I really believe that. I mean, I think that proved to me that was year after year, I think for 12 years, we hit our profit numbers in difficult times. I would hardly say working in Latin America was an easy place to work with inflation and, you know, Chavez and Venezuela and a lot of weird stuff happening that doesn't happen always. Well, Mr. Ramirez. And that was only one question. <laughs> I'm afraid that's all we have time for, but thank you so much for speaking with thank us today. You. And on behalf of the Institute for Leadership Advancement and the Terry College, we'd like to give you this thank gift. You. Well Excellent. So. Photo op. So please join me in all thanking right, Mr. Ramirez. Thank you. Here we go.